Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is George Mann, and I'm honored here to have a fantastic uh, presentation for you by uh, Page Architects and Greg Lujan, who is our new department head. Uh, he couldn't come in at a tough a time with COVID, but he's managing to keep things running uh, as smoothly as possible. And Greg has been invited to do the introductions and it also is a good way for everybody to know, get to know Greg. We also have a number of people in our audience, um, including Ron Skaggs, one of the benefactors of the lecture series. So Ron, welcome. And uh, let me turn this over to Greg now. Well, thank you for the introduction, George, and uh, thank you to the audience for attending these amazing uh, health-focused uh, seminars. I know that George has been doing this for several years, and I'm glad that we can expand this audience even beyond uh, the people in the room. So thank you again, George, for all that you do for our program. Thank I have you. the honor of introducing uh, two guest speakers today. Uh, both from Page Architects. Uh, Robert Doan, AIA, is the principal of Page Architects. He's an Aggie, uh, graduating with the Bachelor of Environmental Design degree in 1985 and a Master of Architecture degree in 1988. Uh, Robert is an internationally recognized industry leader in design, planning, and strategy for Page's health and sciences market sector. He has more than 30 years of experience in architecture practice and is a board certified member of the American College of Healthcare Architects. He leads teams in refining the healthcare markets design on various project types worldwide from acute care hospitals to pediatric specialty facilities and delivers patient focused solutions customized for every aspect of healthcare delivery. Many of his projects resulted in award-winning facility designs, including the Methodist Hospital, the Winnie Palmer Hospital for Women and, and Babies, Children Healthcare Medical Center, and St. Francis Hospital. As a principal within PAGE, Robert is highly skilled in promoting collaboration through dynamic listening to achieve design excellence on every project, and Robert has contributed to successful completion of countless award-winning healing environments throughout the world. As a knowledge leader in healthcare project delivery, Robert applies lean principles and Sigma six thinking to develop efficient building solutions. His attention to detail and desire for excellence are attributes that he enjoys that allow for complex problem solving and innovative design solutions regardless of whether or not they're at the multi-phase complex renovations for campuses to freestanding ground up new campuses. Robert effectively guides large teams in producing environments that excite the senses and define a place. So Robert, welcome. Thank you. I'd also like to introduce uh, Ricardo Munoz, uh, also an associate principal at Page Architects. Uh, Ricardo brings a varied international background to his award-winning work on project types ranging from civic and government to healthcare and corporate commercial work. Before joining PAGE, Ricardo worked in the Northeast and Europe on many project types varying in scale from Cutter's large world-class museum to single family residences at Martha's Vineyard. Ricardo often speaks at the Texas Society of Architects convention and most recently presented a virtual tour of the Brain Performance Institute for the 2020 convention. His projects uh, that he currently has under construction are the James A. Healy Veterans Hospital, New Bed Tower in Tampa, Florida, and the PGA of America headquarters in Frisco, Texas. Ricardo received his Master of Architecture degree from the grad Harvard Graduate School of Design in 2012 and attained his Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Texas at Arlington, where he now teaches design studios and BIM visualization classes. So Ricardo and Robert, thank you. And I look forward to hearing your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Greg. We really appreciate it. And George, always a pleasure. Uh, uh, the connection back to the university is, um, it's personal and special for me. And certainly I would also be remiss if I did not extend uh, a thank you to Mr. Skaggs uh, for all that he does, not only for the university, but also for architecture as a whole. 
uh, we miss you in the industry. I know you're still here in spirit for everything that's going on, but uh, thank you for everything that you've always done for the profession as a whole, Mr. Skaggs. Um, so today we're we're going to talk about uh, really, you know, I think the title was illness to wellness, but it's really more of about a wellness component. And, and I think in in healthcare as a whole, the, the idea of wellness is certainly at the crux of everything moving forward for um, anything in the healing environment. So this is really a, a very um, timely topic and this is a fantastic building. In fact, I was just out there on the job site uh, the last two days. So um, we're three months from being complete and it's gonna be a really exciting project to kind of walk everybody through uh, before we get started on that, um, and Ricardo, if you're advancing, let's just flip to the next one. You guys have heard plenty enough about me, I know that, but uh, <laughs> well, let's just talk a little bit about Page as a whole. Um, we, we are almost 700 people at this point. We have two international affiliates. Um, uh, we kind of go coast to coast now with Washington, D.C. and San Francisco. We just opened a Phoenix office. Our Denver office has been operational for going on 15 years now. And we started in Austin in 1898. Sarah, Sarah, can you mute, please? Thank you. Um, so we started in Austin in 1898, and we have Houston and Dallas affiliates that have been um, working for quite some time. Um, with, with that length or longevity of our firm, we actually um, opened an engineering practice, and actually, I guess, Ricardo, you just flick it to the next slide. Um, really, these are the sectors that we operate in. Um, we really have chosen to specialize in, in primarily uh, six um, technologies. I, I would say there's a seventh one out there because we've gotten into um, aviation quite a bit in the last two or three years. But these have been our six primary sectors and healthcare is by far and away our largest sector and our most um, important sector as far as I'm concerned. Um, I run the health practice here in the Dallas area. Um, but we do collaborate um, internationally with all of our practice offices and practice leaders within this. Um, and it's really exciting to sort of take um, technologies and ideas from each of these sectors and, and collaborate looking at what is the best in class for each of these and how we put them together. In addition to the sectors, we also really look at um, the elements that make this up. So in addition to architecture, we do master planning, consulting, we have a whole strategics group in analytics, lab planning, programming, sustainability, commissioning. But then we also do interiors and uh, engineering. Uh, we are by definition a big A, a little E. Our engineering practice is MEP engineering and structural engineering. We do have a small civil engineering component and landscape architecture component as well, kind of creating the full bind of, of services, service offerings. But architecture drives everything that we do and is very important to our company as a whole. Um, we work with numbers of clients and health systems throughout the United States and we're really excited about um, our relationships with each and every one of these and the more that we understand each each individual system that we work with, each each is unique, each has their own way of doing business and collaborating. And we love to um, collaborate with each of these systems as a whole. Um, so one of these systems is Cone Health. It's in um, Greensboro, North Carolina. And it, um, if you go to the next one, we'll just kind of hit them. So the other thing that I would be remiss in, in not talking about was the team that really helped put this together. Um, because this project is in North Carolina, we did actually partner with a, another firm called RPA Architects. Rick Peterson was, uh, is one of the principals there at RPA. And, and Rob Hefner was heavily involved in that as was Ansi Barfield. But then the rest of our team um, really broke this down with, with Kurt being our true um, health sector leader nationally, Beth Carroll on the design, Wayne Gow on all of the planning processes and architecture pieces, Joan really looking at the front end and the collaboration, and then Roy Watson 
when we say experiential designer, I mean, it was really um, the idea of branding in, in particular and then graphics and wayfinding and how we went with that. And, and then Ricardo did all of the lifting on the design elements that you're gonna see here. So this is really gonna be uh, Ricardo's opportunity to kind of walk you guys um, through the process of design that we went through in looking at this collaboration. So as, as Greg mentioned at the beginning, um, I, I teach um, at the uh, university here in, in Arlington. And um, so I always look at these presentations, these talks and it with a mind towards what, what do students want to know? What do they want to hear? What things did I not know when I was a student? So, you know, this slide also represents, I, I wanted to put it up here to show that Architecture is hard, right? And there's a lot of people involved in putting buildings together. And you may see, you know, the two of us presenting this project, but, but a lot of conversations, a lot of meetings, traveling to Greensboro, a lot of things like that occurred. And, uh, you know, we get to do the fun part, Robert also talking about our work and all of our experiences and sharing our project. But I'm gonna sort of take it in that approach as well, not just showing you, you know, this is our project, but some of the design process that, that we go through. Um, as Robert mentioned, Cone Health is in uh, uh, North Carolina, uh, and it, it's a, a big hospital system that serves um, uh, that county, but as well as uh, surrounding counties um, in, in Greensboro. So when we first approach the project, we always want to, any project, we always want to immerse ourselves in the culture and the community, especially in a place that we haven't uh, worked in before. So at the beginning of the design process, we put all of these images together to sort of talk to the client and understand, you know, are we on the, are on the right track here? Are we, are we uh, you know, what, what things should we be responding to? And really, because that building is gonna serve that community, we want it to reflect the community and design and, and, and everything and tying it into trails and, and whatever types of activities and events occur, um, will occur at that location. Um, so here is our site. You see Greensboro is there on the, on the, towards the bottom right side. But then you also see the other Cone Health facilities surrounding, as I was mentioning earlier. And if we zoom in a little more, this is, this is our actual site. Um, Highway or Interstate 840 is currently under construction, I believe. And, um, and the other intersection there you see is Battleground Avenue and Drawbridge Parkway. And that's the name of the project at the moment, Cone Health Medical Center. Uh, drawbridge med center actually and so you know these are some of the diagrams that we developed at the beginning to understand what we're dealing with here understand the scale any green spaces uh, any types of things like that that would impact our design hey um, ricardo sure um, can you go back two slides and then you can run the video again so one of the one of the things that's always important and probably doesn't get talked about as much when we look at healthcare as a whole or health systems and strategies associated with them, uh, you see the road in red or the roads in red. That those are really actually new builds. So you can kind of see the downtown or the city center for Greensboro as a whole, and then you get to. Uh, effectively how most cities end up developing where you put loop roads or ring roads around them at five miles out at 10 miles out at 15 miles out and then strategically neighborhoods form and you start to look at clusters for where things are at. Um, Houston Methodist has done this very successfully in, in Texas um, with their developments and a lot of the work that we've been able to do with them but the, the drawbridge project, as you can see, is at sort of a, a right at the extension of this freeway, this loop road that's, that's continuing to build Greensboro and allow it to grow. And it's one of really six current facilities that they have. And they're really looking to get to close to 19 of them within the next 10 years. So really the growth map for understanding how the health system is really operating. Thanks, Ricardo. Mm -hmm. So this clip is just a screenshot from Google Earth just to show you sort of the topography and, and what we're dealing with. Where that red marker is, um, that is where our project is, but that facility you see there is an old grocery store that was, um, that was removed for this project. And um, as you can see on the right-hand side, the topography is quite high. I would say there's probably, I don't know, Robert, like a 50 foot drop from the right side of, the, of that image all the way to drawbridge, which, yes. In, in, um, 
you know, in, when you start developing projects, uh, working on real life projects, you'll realize that no site is ever flat, really. Um, whether it's a footfall from end to end or something like this, that's 50 feet. And so in this case, we use that topography, that change to, to work to our advantage. And, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. So, so one of the things that Ricardo was showing there with the food lion that was there, just so you know, the evolution of projects and it's not always a linear path. Um, when we actually started this project, the interview for the project, um, the original goal was to put a wellness center inside of the food line. And the project budget for that was $5.5 .5 million all in. Um, when we expanded where their vision wanted to be and how they wanted to impact the neighborhood, um, the project went to $95 million and a complete brand new facility that encompasses this entire property and not just a little piece at the back of it. And Robert, they also purchased an additional tract, if I recall, some halfway through the project. Is that correct? Yes, the one that's got the little purple video camera on it is was the was a new addition. And before they're done, it wouldn't surprise me if they bought the Jake's restaurant at the very front um, for expansion opportunities. So now I'm going to walk a little bit about the, what I was mentioning, the design process. Um, the design process can, you know, it's very, it, it rarely or seldom is linear, right? Where you do one thing, you show it, they like it, you know, and then you move forward. There are always several iterations. Um, even if, even if the, you know, it's semi-linear, the building is always going to be changing because you learn new information, a new property gets, gets uh, purchased, uh, something is found in the, in the soil, uh, you know, there may be on another project we had a, a uh, I believe like a uh, gas tank that was uh, underneath the parking lot that we no one knew anything about and not until they were doing uh, studies that they find found out that there used to be a gas station on the site. So lots of things can come up during the process that you don't you don't really expect and you have to deal with it or, or figure out how to make it work to your advantage. Um, in our design process, we always start by doing site analysis and diagrams. So all those site analysis that you do in school that your professors make you do they really help you tell the story not not just for yourself to understand the site but also to explain to the client uh what you're trying to achieve and try to understand what what's important to them where what visibility points if we're talking about these images here you know where are gonna what are going to be the focal points what are people going to see when they arrive at an intersection um and uh you know those types of things um at the very beginning, we, we uh, um, this was actually for the interview to get to win the project. Um, we presented a design solution that we kind of developed, you know, in a vacuum. We, we did it on, on, our, on our end, not really having interaction with the client as much, just to give them an idea of the possibilities and to get them excited and to show that we can be flexible and we, we want to collaborate with them. And that we're not coming and imposing a design on them, but that we want to work with them to arrive at it. So you see some of the uh, sketches on the left-hand side, and then we developed four massing options, and then we took one of those options and we we um, developed it even further. So we created images. Um, this has to do with Robert. What Robert was talking about wellness. This facility um, not only is 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 you know, fixing what's wrong with you, but also preventing what, things that could uh, potentially go wrong. So they wanted to create, uh, create um, you know, fitness activities, fitness, fitness areas, uh, opportunities for retail, for, for restaurants, opportunities to engage with the community, creating an amphitheater and potentially bringing food trucks and that, that type of thing. And so um, we, again, this was presented at the, at the, uh, at the interview, you see the building is on the higher part of the property now that you see there, and the, the parking garage is on the left-hand side, and we were embedding it in the landscape or in the topography at that moment. Is, uh, as we move forward with the design, you know, we always also want to engage the client or the clients, the, the users um, in the best way that we can, and not everyone is trained as an architect or, or interior designer or, or in planning, and so, um, we often use VR and immersive design. So 
This was a slide again that we prepared for the interview. And if you hold up your phone to any one of those QR codes, it'll take you to a link where you can scroll around on your phone and look at uh, different aspects of the building. And so, you know, we also had VR goggles at the interview and some of the clients got up and put, put them on. And, and so that was kind of exciting for us. And that's something that we use in our design process. Robert, you want to talk about this slide? <laughs> Well, in, a, in addition to that, as we as we got going, um, we we at Page usually describe everything with beginning with a visioning session. So, um, your your goals, your inspiration, you know, what is the outcome of this? So there was actually about seventy people in a room, and we spent uh, an entire day going through. Um, what was a very collaborative process about what are they trying to accomplish? What would be a win for them? What constitutes success? Um, in addition to that, um, Cone Health um, is very instrumental in the lean planning process and using uh, IPD, which is integrated project design or project delivery. Um, so we had uh, Brassfield and Gorey as a contractor on board and ourselves on board and Cone Health on board all at the same time at the beginning of the project, at the, at the very starting point of the project. And this for me was at least, uh, we, we've talked about this for almost a decade, but this was the first project that actually signed a, an IPD contract. So um, Paige was and still is um, a participant in the IPD process, meaning that um, all of the partners in this contract have signed a joint agreement as opposed to individual separate agreements. And we all share in the success of the project. I, I should say success or failure, but it's definitely been a success. Um, so that is a part of the story as well in, in terms of, uh, you know, a lot of what Ricardo's talking about is process oriented or process driven, right? What is programming? What is master planning? What is design? What is planning versus what is the finished element or component that is actually going to make an, an impact on society and change culture for a community? So this is the starting point of, of where we're at with our tools. And then I think Ricardo's probably going to talk to you a little bit about the design thinking books as well. Yeah, so, so one of our communication tools, um, and you can see it in action there on the right hand side in these images, is we, for our, during the design meetings, actually, we create a, a booklet that encompasses everything that will be spoken about that day. And also, uh, in some cases, has a questionnaire, or, or, yeah, or we ask people to. Delta. We ask people. I mean, we ask people to. Um, sorry. Whatever. Okay. Heather, uh, could you, you please get on that plane to France? Thank you. So, um, we we create these booklets that really encompass what we're going to talk about and leave with some important questions. And so these become a series of booklets through the design process that the client can, the client and us can go back to as decision points and say, oh yeah, we, we decided on this option or we'd like this material or we like the way that this planning is working. And so um, these have become a very incredible asset. It, it's a little more tactile. You know, we obviously could email them our PowerPoints, but then that just stays on someone's uh, email account. But with this, you could have them stacked, you know, at your desk and, and refer to them. And it's really a, an effective tool to, to work through the design process. Another aspect that um, um, we often do is, is developing full-scale mock-ups. So I believe this is inside that grocery store, correct, Robert? The one that you were mentioning, the food line? Yes. And so um, you see that cardboard behind uh, some of those speak, uh, people around that meeting. We mock up the sizes of, of, of the corridors, of the exam rooms, of the nurse stations and really help the client visualize physically what these spaces will, will feel like and you know, get to know, you know how um, the counter height or, or how much storage they, they would need. But it's really a fun activity and it's engaging and it, and it, you know, and it changes opinions, right? And one thing is looking at it 2D on the, on the plan and another thing is walking through the space. So throughout the design process, we're not, only looking at planning and massing, but also very early on, what materials are we going to use? Cone Health has a very uh, important um, innovation team that came to every meeting. 
and they were very interested in us using natural materials or materials that reference nature. And so um, the brown images that, or the images of brown material you see there is a wood, a wood plank that we were uh, proposing and, and that made it to the project to use on the building to add warmth and, and sort of create that inviting, welcoming experience that we're after. Um, we're also using local materials such as that brick. I believe we have four different types of, of, of brick that we're using there. And also taking into account sustainability always, right? So creating uh, sun shading devices, overhangs, so that we can have lots of natural daylight, but that it's, it's controlled, right? You're not, getting, you're not getting too much direct sunlight into the building. These are just other views of, of different materials on different sides, and you'll see how these work on... on uh, uh, on the building in a few images. So I, as I was mentioning, uh, the design process can, can sort of a lengthy and very uh, uh, involved detailed uh, process. And so these next images just show all the variations of the project and ultimately what we landed on. So the, for, the first four massings across the top are, the, uh, are what we presented at the interview. And then on the second row, um, you see some of the uh, renderings that we created. And then by the third row, we're moving into more reality of the project. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, so we're still working with terraces there. Um, we're trying to understand how the parking works. Again, the, the top row here, a little bit more detailed, trying to incorporate the things that are important. And then when we got to around schematic design four, we sort of radically changed the project for lots of reasons. but. Now you see that the parking garage is actually on the highest part of the property. And the facility is sort of uh, in the middle there or closer to the, closer to the grade at, at the street level. And so we did that for, as I mentioned, lots of reasons. But one of, those reasons, one of those opportunities that it allowed us to do was to dig into that earth and provide some of our functions, some of the uh, programs that Robert's going to talk through when we get to later. But really, we had a, a fork in the road here, or two options that we presented. The left one was called um, uh, the panoramic porch, and the one on the right-hand side was called the uh, uh, scenic, oh, I forget, scenic suite, actually. And so as a team, everyone gravitated towards the, the porch concept because that seemed more inviting, more welcoming. Everyone could imagine themselves inhabiting the, those spaces and really becoming a, a focal point and a, and a gathering space for the community. We incorporated terraces there that you see, you'll see in the later images, um, but they are, they are a little bit different than when we first designed. Again, more process picks of, of the, uh, the two options that we sort of uh, presented. And then we'll go through, we're gonna go through the actual design as it's being built today. This is a landscape plan that shows you um, how we're integrating you know, that topography as well as parking into the, into the site. Our, our, our project, our, our building is, is what you see there in white. And then you see the parking garage structure up there that's sort of hidden behind the building, which I think was a good, good approach. Um, so, so Ricardo, I'm gonna interject a couple of thoughts here. So one of the things we really haven't um, established or teed up for you as a, as a group is the primary elements that make the building up. So when Ricardo was looking at the design elements, um, the project had a freestanding emergency department and really um, coming with the freestanding emergency department was uh, several clinics that were going to be involved with this. And these were really going to be subspecialists. So whether that was cancer oncology, whether it's orthopedics, um, the heart and vascular component or general medicine. Um, with the oncology piece, we had an infusion therapy piece. And with the freestanding emergency department, there were some support functions like lab and pharmacy that really needed to be involved. And, and in addition to that, then the wellness component came into play. So it was a full wellness campaign that really went from just what is a workout facility to we want an aquatics facility to we want programmed areas we want community spaces with open spaces and the front porch piece that you're talking about for how do we um, create programmed activities and then we also want something for children and kids as well because if this is going to be a family location how do you engage family members children in particular 
at a location, you know, and, and then it has to be age independent. So if you have somebody that's a toddler that's two, what do you do? And if you have somebody that's six or seven, what do they do? Are they using the swimming facilities? Do you have other pieces? So they actually engaged with a group called Tumbles to develop a, a children's component that was actually a wellness based piece as well. So this really works. And if you think about this as kind of the YMCA or your local recreation center meets healthcare clinics and specialties meets the freestanding emergency department, which is effectively a hospital without beds. So there's a lot of disparate pieces or elements that are trying to come together here. So as we originally were looking at this, which one would be prominent, which one would take priority? And then this particular site is on a path that's, that's part of a wellness program for the entire city of Greensboro. So there's a biking trail that goes through here and a hiking trail, and this became uh, a perfect spot for a respite position that actually uh, integrates this directly within that trail position. So the city of Greensboro actually loved a lot of the activities that were taking place within the realm of this. So part of our design campaign that Ricardo was talking to was, if you've got all these activities and all of a sudden now we've got 600 people or 600 cars that we have to accommodate, how do we do that without creating this sea of parking? And then on top of that, if we're going to have uh, an emergency department or clinics where we have folks that are not as ambulatory as perhaps they could be, you know, can we get to the density of a garage so you only have to tra tra traverse horizontally into the building and get a direct link to wherever it is you're trying to go without having to go up and down stairs. So each of these were very defining points for how the building ended up coming together. The other thing that Ricardo showed you at the beginning of the project was that freeway loop that was being constructed, um, Highway 840, that loop road. Um, has a very visual approach to this particular site. And we wanted to make sure as a team and part of the innovation sessions was, how do we create branding for this and visual identity for this coming from not only the freeway, but from Battleground, which is a very major thoroughfare through the city. So how do we create identity? How do we locate people in parking and vehicles? And then how do we create an extension of the park all of those were elements that this one particular diagram starts to talk about. So I wanted to share a little bit about that background before we go into the planning. So perfect, perfect segue into that. So this is the, what we call the garden level. So ground floor from the left-hand side, this is actually uh, 18 feet um, vertical exposed all at grade. And this is directly, so the emergency <laughs> department is here. Uh, hey, George, can you make yes. the image possibly bigger, or is it me on my screen? Um, I think you could probably do your shift deal on that to make it bigger, but you may have to pop out of the presentation mode to do oh, it. Okay, all right. So it's me. All right. Thank you. Sorry about the interruption. No, no not a problem. So, yeah. so the, the freestanding emergency department is in to not bog you guys down in technical terms with respect to this, but this is an ambulatory care facility. So while this entire building is a business occupancy and for all of you guys that may deal with George's health studio, um, you know, if you're in a hospital direct and you're in an institutional set setting or an I2 occupancy, um, the FSED is really part of what we call ambulatory healthcare. And that piece of it is still separated, still has a lot of the component forces of a hospital, but it is still a business occupancy. Um, there's a lot of boring stuff that we won't get into with respect to um, a number of persons that are incapable of self-preservation, et cetera, from a life, life safety code standpoint. But needless to say, this piece is the illness piece of the project, right? So if you're coming here as a destination for illness, it's a step above urgent care. Uh, effectively, the way Cone markets these, you would actually think you're in a hospital. Um, we have a full imaging component with MRI, CT, RAD, and, and then um, a major, major treatment room, the recess room, and, and then um, 18 exam bays. So this is your physical health position from this. And it's 
separated by a one hour separation, fire separation from the rest of the facility. So one of the pieces is how do we create its own identity, which comes from the access point on Drawbridge Road and its identity there, and then the ambulances to the back of that. And then how do we create a completely separate identity if we go to the next level and we really look at the main entrance. So where downstairs, you're on the left-hand side, you're entering at the garden level. Upstairs, this is the first floor and you're entering from the south side of the building and your south, um, your south uh, arrival position. So you would come up to this front door, you have a drop off and you have your garage access point directly to the right hand side. The, the garage has a flow directly into the building off the lateral corridor. And then the front porch is really important to, you know, you saw the rendering rendered images of this, but that front porch becomes the whole wellness campaign and it has indoor outdoor space, the porch or patio itself allows for this whole balcony component because Greensboro has such lovely weather for 10 months out of the year that you know they can put their programmed components in there like yoga components or other studio exercises where you can work outdoors or indoors and you've got the very large glass spans that are going through there so um, it, it becomes very exciting in that realm but outside of that you have studios A and B which are really set up for again, more programmed activities on the internal side. And then a full-fledged basketball court. We have a rehab component in, inside of the space. And then we actually integrated an aquatics piece in their wellness program as well. When you get to the tan areas of development, this was the other piece that was incredibly important to Cone. So we have community space and community rooms available to, to all the folks that are working out there. And then directly above, and we're not gonna go there yet, but directly above, we have two levels of clinics. And so the intent here is a very sophisticated approach to well being as a whole, that we can get patrons to come here when, when they're well and healthy and actually work out. In addition to that, we've got a full food program where they're doing a teaching kitchen to how do you prepare meals? How do you prepare healthy meals for various components? And it's actually educational in nature and programmed exercises in, what if you have diabetes? What if you have heart condition? How do, how do we prepare meals that are gonna make sense to you? And then be able to package those meals up and sell them out um, as, as well. So you can just you know do grab and go and buy this, take it home and in 30 minutes you can cook. Um, and it's a very healthy meal. So how do we center all of that together to where you're going to your doctor's office, but you also have a wellness component and oh, by the way, if you do have an emergency, well, it's right here too. So it's a complete continuum of care for how we develop the entire space. In, a, in addition to that one piece, the, the pharmacy always comes up on every, every element and uh, retail pharmacy is always a, a conversation piece just in terms of how does a how does a patient or a patron um, how do you how do you serve them the best? And this is straight out of the hospitality book of, you know, rather than have to go down the street to Walgreens and get a prescription from your physician and take that to Walgreens and get it filled, that they have a, a retail pharmacy directly connected to this this facility. So as you as you get your prescription, you can go directly downstairs and fill it. And in some cases, they even have the concierge service where if you're upstairs in the clinic itself, they will call the pharmacy downstairs, get the prescription, and then the pharmacist will have a runner that will come up to the actual clinic and give it to you before you check out. So again, um, we talked about those market sectors and how you look at, you know, how a hospitality based sector can influence a healthcare sector. Uh, this is one way in which that occurs. So the other thing is, as we go to this, this is the mezzanine level. So we have a 24 foot floor to floor height on our first floor here specifically to allow for tall ceilings and really uh, elegant spaces for um, patrons to experience. So inside of this, we're able to put um, a running track, an indoor running track 
um, on the mezzanine level of the first floor. So your workout equipment, your free weight component is upstairs, your running track is upstairs, but then you have an open venue directly down to the rest of your facilitated exercise component. Moving beyond that, then this really gets to the clinic piece. There are two stackable pieces or positions. Um, the upstairs of the front porch actually turned out to work very well for an infusion therapy area. This is probably going to be one of my favorite spaces um, programmatically in the space. Um, for those of you that have not had to experience cancer, good for you. Um, it's a it's a tough deal, and you know the fortunately the outcomes are, are getting better and better all the time so it's great but with technology with the understanding of of chemotherapy and what we can do with with chemistry to create that um, folks that are in that process or in that procedure tend to have to come for anywhere from um, two hours for a pep component to six to eight hours for administrating ivs for their chemotherapy over the course of a six to nine month process uh, in infusion. And so we were able to create these spaces, these bays that are um, fully glazed in, in underneath that porch and look back out onto that park-like setting. So a very positive nature and distraction orientation for each of these patients that are coming here, sometimes daily, sometimes every other day for uh, anywhere from two months to six months period of time. Uh, outside of the infusion, then the oncology clinic component actually starts on the left-hand side and shotguns in the back, in the, in, towards the back of the facility. Um, with respect to the facility as a whole, it's a very, a, again, a hospitality approach. This actually comes straight out of Disney in terms of their terminology for onstage and offstage approach to things. So the front, which is the gray area, which is a primary public corridor, has direct links to the parking structure. So you can come directly, you can park directly on the level that you're on and come straight across from the garage into your space. So we have the onstage um, space for check-in and multiple ways to check-in, uh, technology with the phone, technology with iPads, or actually just checking in with an actual person at an admitting, admitting desk. So the intent is to have the waiting rooms be as empty as possible and to get throughput directly into each one of the subspecialty clinics um, through the vertical stack. Um, from the opposite side, if you start at the north end of the plan, that's really your staff corridor. And so your staff areas come from the top, public comes from the bottom, and everything meets in the actual areas of care, which is the clinic environment in the middle. Um, we tried to structure this, um, you know, Ricardo talked about the the clinic arrangement in, in the cardboard city as we did mock-ups for these, the whole point was to understand what size an exam room needed to be, how many steps did a clinician need to take in order to get to the exam rooms, how many steps did a patient need to take in order to get from the exam rooms, from where their vehicle is into the exam rooms, and the very efficient approach to this. And in many cases, these are what we call condominiumized. So, um, sometimes care is only delivered by subspecialists on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and other subspecialists on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So we tried to be efficient and lean in how we set up the exam components and allowing each of the individuals to, to share a, a common approach to how we were delivering care there. The other thing that's come up through COVID is obviously telehealth. Telehealth has become exceptionally accepted at this point. Uh, thank God to CMS for reimbursement criteria at this point for all of that, but uh, that has worked very well and it's, it's, uh, it's integrated into each of these. The, the third floor then is, with the exception of infusion, is the clinic component again with more subspecialties on it. So that's the planning arrangement that goes through that. And Ricardo, I think it goes back to you from there. Right. So now we're gonna walk through a series of perspectives that show what the project actually looks like and, and it's pretty close to what will be built. This is that porch that we've been mentioning all along and um, you can see you can open doors immediately from that space, from that uh, fitness area and come out to this terrace. And you have uh, turf there for those classes that Robert was mentioning, yoga or other types of, of uh, uh, things or activities like that, you have some seating and then you have a series, uh, a series of terraces that step down that aren't in this view, but you'll be able to see later. The main entrance is there on the right-hand side. 
if we go to this image, you understand that the entrance is on the right hand side and the emergency entrance is on the on the left. And we're purposely keeping those separated uh, because they're two different uh, two different things that we want to make sure um, you know you're not distracted by an ambulance coming in, uh, coming in back there, or having someone dropped off there. So there are two different experiences that occur. And those terraces that I was mentioning are are there in the foreground that step down to to mediate the landscape. This would be the main drop off. You see the porch and you see this tall tower, which actually has a glass uh, pattern, uh, uh, what we call a frit pattern that has a, um, um, the, uh, I believe it's a longleaf pine, which is a, the state tree of, of North Carolina. But again, this was something that we discovered through the collaboration of, of wanting to incorporate references to nature so that those types of things uh, help in healing and, and making you feel calm and, and welcome. Um, you have the garage on the right-hand side. I'm, uh, it's out of view, but, but it would be on the right-hand side there. And if we go all around to the back of the building, um, there you see the aquatics piece that Robert was mentioning on the, on the, on the uh, right-hand side of the image. But between the garage and, the, and our building, and uh, we have the community rooms, and we have an outdoor courtyard, which which something that was asked for by the client to be able to host activities outside. And I suspect this space will be used a lot, um, you know, for, for talks, for classes, maybe a movie night. Um, and they all frame landscape that is um, where we would be uh, standing right now. So that's a really cool space that we have there that, that, that um, we were excited about. And you'll see, you'll see in images later. This is again a view of that courtyard, just looking back at the building. We have large sliding doors that can open and allow there to be some, some uh, indoor outdoor activities on nice days. This would be the walk from the garage. So the garage would be behind us. And this is what you would experience on, the, on level one as you approach the gallery. And part of the focus of this lobby and, and, and the design is that you're able to see all these activities that are occurring. So, there in the, in the background, you see the fitness area and you see people running on that running track. You might see people lifting weights. Um, there in the middle where you have that large screen and tables is a digital hub where you could come and, and check in for an appointment or if you have a question about, about something, someone could come and help you, almost like an Apple Genius Bar. And then as we go to the right, um, we have the community rooms, but I'll talk about that um, but right at the center of the image, we have this tree, which is actually a column for the building. And again, this is one of those references that, that we um, talked about during the, present, during the design process as including a reference to, to nature and to, and to um, uh, things that would make you feel comfortable and, 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 and inviting, have an inviting experience when you're coming in. This is a view of the community rooms there on the right-hand side. We have, uh, these can be uh, almost like a ballroom, they could be opened up to create a large space or, or have a, a folding wall that would come out and, and make them smaller spaces. You see the courtyard there in the background and, and I think that's a, another view of what you would see there. And we have landscaping trees and, and bushes that would hide some of that garage that you see there. Um, but that's a nice comfortable space back there. This is a view of, the, of what's inside the porch, I would say, and this is the fitness area. We have all this equipment that you see in the foreground and the mezzanine level that has that walking running track above. This is if you go up the stairs to sort of the back of the fitness area looking at the, uh, at the walking track. And then this would be one of the studio spaces that Robert was mentioning earlier. There's two of these and, and they're very flexible. They wanted minimal glazing so that they could control how much light is coming in for, for yoga, those types of, of sessions. Then we have a view of the, of the gymnasium of the basketball court that Robert mentioned earlier as well. We have some, um, some glazing along the top so as to not create distractions when players are, are, are playing or, or have too much direct sunlight come into the building. And here we have the aquatics uh, component, that large part of the project that's at the back end. And we have a, a leisure pool and, and rehab. And you see there the, those different sizes of the pools and the way people would be using them. And then we have a lap pool 
that is larger and, and would be more for uh, recreation and sure exercise and those types of things. So as part of the design process uh, or as part of the project, um, a lot of times contractors will install uh, cameras, monitors on site so that you can view the project from, from wherever you are. So this was taken, I believe two days ago, I downloaded a time-lapse from the contractor's um, uh, link. And just, it's from the very beginning, you see the topography there, the, the right side is quite tall and you see the freeway under construction on the left-hand side. You start to see that garden level being poured there in the background, the terrace is being formed on the left-hand side and you really see the, the fast steel erection come up. And now this would be, um, sort of what you would see if you're driving towards the main entrance. That tall tower sort of symbolizes where the main entrance is. And we see the porch on the left-hand side there that will be clad in that wood material. And I think Robert uh, mentioned that the garage was quite far along uh, since he was there. So I think you begin to see more of that, more of that be installed. Uh, well, that's, there's more of that <laughs> currently uh, on the project. Um, I scroll down and I see Son Jay in here. So Robert, um, did I miss anything? Is there anything else you wanted me to, to go over? No, I think we actually uh, extended our, our, our timing here. So we uh -huh. might have a little less time for questions. George, I'm going to turn it over to your team for uh, your students for anything they may want to ask. It, what a what a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, the um, I particularly like the detail that you went into and also the video or the uh, visuals of construction. I think we need to do more with the construction people in our educational program. So I'll turn this over to the audience. Uh, please, uh, if you wouldn't mind saying your name and what you do before you ask the question, that would be nice to hear. Well, um, I've got a question or two. This is Bill Ide. Um, from the, your interview date to the opening, first day you see a patient is how long? Uh, interview January a year ago, and first patient will be October 15th of this year. So I guess that's two and a half years. Yeah. Wow, that's a remarkable schedule. That's good. Great project, guy. I really and I enjoyed the presentation. Learned a lot. Um, the wood you're using, um, I've always worried about weathering aspects of wood. Was that a consideration? How do you deal with? Yeah, to be fair, there was a lot of conversation about that, and it's a Trespa product, which is actually a it's a wood it's a wood veneer exterior with a polymer that's that's a high pressure polymer behind it. So it's a rain screen product. It's not going to act or react like wood at all. In hmm. fact, uh, putting it on the building typology that we have, we I don't think we would have actually been able to use real wood, just from a fire standpoint. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it looks great. Yeah, it's a good choice. And Rob and uh, Ricardo, that's a wonderful project and then really enjoy your presentation. And uh, Robert, always uh, always great to hear your uh, your talk and uh, with you in person or now virtually. And I, I'm curious, you know, uh, when you have a really, you know, uh, strong statement about the entrance uh, you know, down on the lower level and uh, would that create some confusion for wayfinding? because you have different engines, right? Um, yeah, that's a great point, um, Jipang. Um, you know, the, the whole idea of how does a freestanding emergency department really work because it's a completely disparate element from your wellness component, your illness to your wellness. And it also has its own code requirements associated with it. You know, the, the idea that it says emergency, the letters are backlit, they're on generator, they have to be a certain size. Um, and to a certain extent, that's the one you really want your value proposition from because that's, that's where emergent traffic is actually coming. So people that are not apt to make a decision in advance that it's a rush, it's an emergency. And so we really wanted that to be fronting the lowest component of the road and the, and the broadest entrance to the road. Whereas the day-to-day -day aspect of where people are making wellness-based decisions and coming here repeatedly, 
they have more of the parkland stroll up the driveway and experience the park you get to a drop off and then enter through a garage so really the whole juxtaposition of splitting the emergency department to be slightly embedded underneath the building but still have its own identity from one side was really the the conclusion that everybody collectively made and that bear in mind that you know uh, you know the art and science of 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 design is what the definition of architecture is we really look to what we do as being facilitators we're brokers uh, we're trying to communicate ideas and create plus deltas for our clients and really um influence what the client is thinking but make sure that it's the client's ideas that are being generated so that's ultimately the decision that the collective group from account health determined was the best for them and that's that's great point uh, robert thank you Robert, thank you uh, again for the presentation. And I really appreciate the insights to your, I guess we'll call it holistic approach uh, to understanding the systems strategy and discovery uh, approaches, which is really fantastic to give that kind of behind the scenes look to it. I'm, I'm wondering though, uh, in the way that you talked about it as kind of a simultaneous uh, project development, linking to goals, uh, aspirations, and outcomes, that it seems like the connective tissue that you are describing as materiality, landscapes, and community scales uh, requires a, a kind of a multi-scalar approach to thinking about design. So it's not just about the function of the building and how it operates. Um, and so because of the way that you do the visioning sessions, I'm wondering, is there something else that is happening now um, as we're starting to emerge, you know, post COVID that starts, that gives us a little bit more pause to think about those kind of spatial moments that you are describing that are happening both inside and outside uh, the building, but also gets us to think more about this illness to wellness at a totally different scale. It's, it's, it's an interesting uh, comment and, you know, we had the, uh... We had one of the board of directors, the CEO of the hospital, and then the director of ambulatory care uh, on a walk Wednesday morning, just touring the facility. And it was it was the you know the director of ambulatory care has been embedded in this process since the beginning. Uh, it's really his vision, Dino Atkins. Um, but to to listen to the president and then hear the chairman of the board in in the discussions that they actually think this is going to be um, inherently better. For them because of COVID because people people will attach this to Cone Health and they'll say hey you know what this is a wellness component but it's Cone Health wellness and I've got clinics right here they really know what they're it, even the subliminal message they really know what they're doing this is a health provider and I've got a wellness component here so they have to be from a subliminal standpoint taking better care of me doing better in terms of how do we protect the environment protect the individual so they think that's actually going to be a different differentiator and a difference maker for themselves but to be fair to your question it's one that is a million dollar question in fact it's a 95 million dollar question because um, until it opens until we actually get patrons that are actually willing to sign up for a monthly deal to come here and then experience their physician practice at the same time and then how does that really work for now I know exactly where my emergency room needs to be as well so it becomes truly an embedded component in the community that that is something that has not yet been proven out yet it, it's a lot of talent, a lot of organizing principles behind it, but we still, as, a, as all organizations need to know, um, what are the success measures at the end of the day? And, and if I, I could just take yeah, that. I was gonna say to Ricardo, to that point, I mean, you've talked about the adaptability components, right? So there are things that are fixed and some things that are flexible. I wonder if you can expand on that. Yeah, so um, um, as I mentioned, um, I think one of the important aspects of this is your ability to be able to expand activities to the outside, like physically open doors and have, have that uh, communication, visual and physical communication. Um, that um, those community rooms, as I mentioned, they open out to that courtyard, but they also can uh, function as smaller or, or one sm two smaller rooms or, or one larger room. And I think, I, I really think it comes down to 
um, the clients uh, sort of also being on board and having a vision of, of embracing the outdoors and nature and fresh air and natural daylight. There's a lot of glass on this building and we did a lot of studies to make sure that that uh, you get daylight, but not not direct sunlight that would cause heat gain and all those types of things. Uh, we did lots of studies. We have sun shading devices, like I said, but that's something that the client, you know, has to also be hand in hand with us because uh, for an another client, they could just want maybe the most efficient brick box with the with the minimal amount of windows so that they can just uh, maximize their their uh, profitability. But it's really uh, I feel like I, we were lucky to have a client that, that allow us to explore some pretty different ideas, not just your typical, you know, if you see this building, you probably don't expect it to be a healthcare project, right? It seems like a sort of a wellness. You see people having ex, uh, exercising, you, you hear that there's a pool there and it's, and it's, it's really a unique facility that we were really lucky to be a part of and, and, uh, and uh, we're excited for when it opens. Wonderful. 